Welcome to Behind the Curtain, where we discuss everything from aliens and conspiracies to ancient civilizations and religions, all from a biblical perspective. All right, um, you ready to start? I'm ready. Okay, well, uh, Josh, I have a Christmas present for you, an early Christmas present. Well, it's about time. It's these mic shields. For, oh, no, I'm just shields. kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, if you look at our post on Instagram, you'll notice we have some contraptions in front of us. That's we're, because... We're hiding in the shadows. It's because the... I'm obsessing over audio right now, <laughs> and I heard that these might help, so we'll see. Whatever works. We're also recording in, like, a concrete room, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we do have a lovely shelf with books on it in the background. Yeah. Some little fake plants. Getting, fake books getting, too. Yeah, fake books. <laughs> Dude, that one says Mayan prophecies. Yeah, so let's talk about Mayans. Dude, no, we, need no, I'm to just find the, we need to find the innards of that book. Add that to the list of uh, that's right up our things alley we're right taking, there. things we're talking about in future episodes. <laughs> we need to make a. Let's do this. Let's post on Instagram mm-hmm. just a. a, a an iPhone like notes app, mm-hmm. just a list of all the things, <laughs> all the things we've mentioned. <laughs> yeah, we're like, yeah. we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about that yeah. later. <laughs> like maybe we can do like a, uh, maybe we can do like a listener's choice, like pick one of oh, these yeah, topics. There you go. And... Whoever sends in the most money, we'll pick that person's topic. <laughs> Um, well, no, your, the Christmas present I, I mentioned is not, these were a Christmas present for me, not oh, okay. for you. Um, yeah, they're great. But uh, we get to read Genesis 6 today. Bro, this has been the moment that we've all been waiting, at least I've been waiting for. Yeah. I don't know about the listener, but dude, Genesis 6 is the, it's the Pandora's box of theology. Yeah, yeah it's kind of the hinge for all the crazy. I don't think people really, truly, uh, uh, your average pew sitting Christian doesn't realize the um, the importance of this passage, really, no, and how and much it connects to so many other things. Yeah, and we we talked about this in the last episode when we were talking about Adam and Eve. But uh, you know, the modern Christian paradigm is kind of that everything is the fault of Adam and Eve right. and yeah, the, the serpent fault. in Genesis 3. And um, if you look back over early church history and Judaism, like in the Second Temple period and all that, um, a lot of people were more concerned with Cain and Cain's descendants than Adam and Eve. Right. And I think that that's because Adam and Eve, you can kind of gather from the Genesis story that Adam and Eve remained in God's favor. Like they, 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 re, they rebelled, they sinned, um, but they were like, they maintained their relationship with the Lord. They remained faithful to him yeah, after their, that. Their shame was covered yeah. by God. Yeah. Whereas Cain does some bad stuff. Yeah. He's a bad guy. Yeah. And his descendants were bad guys because they learned from Cain. They were, uh, you know, in the image of Cain, right? So anyway, so we'll talk about that a little bit today, but it kind of comes to a climax in Genesis 6. Yep. And so, um, yeah, so today we're not going to go too deep in any one topic. Uh, Like we're going to talk a little bit about the sons of God in Genesis 6, the Nephilim, the purpose of the flood, but we're going to cover all those deeper and future episodes. So today is going to be kind of a very broad, shallow overview of. So like chapters four through six. We'll do like chapters four through six. So, and and so here's why, here's why we have to do that. Um, I'm gonna pull up my outline here. It's a lot of stuff, man. Yeah, dude. So here's, here's the deal. Uh, Genesis six starts out. So I'll just read the first, uh, we'll do the one through eight. Mm Mm-hmm. It says, when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, uh, or the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, that's B'nai Elohim, right? Mm -hmm. Sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he's flesh, and his day shall be 120 years. Uh, It says in verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, Mm -hmm. when the sons of God came into the son, the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. Mm-hmm. These were mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. 
and I'm going to keep going because mm-hmm. we can get hung up on that, that verse yep. right there. We can sit there uh, all year. Verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention and the thoughts of his heart was only continually evil. Uh, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land uh, and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, mm-hmm. for I'm sorry that I've made them. Mm. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's verse 8. Right. So that's where we'll pause for now. So this portion of Scripture takes up a very, very small part in the whole Bible, but even in, even just in the scope of Genesis right. or the pre-flood world. It, you know, after the flood, you get the Tower of Babel and Abraham and you know, Abraham's sons and all that stuff. And that's when the ball really gets rolling Mm -hmm. with the biblical story about Israel and all that. But, um, yeah, this part of the story is, is huge and it takes up this much, you know, verses. Yeah. So, uh, how many years are in between those eight verses? (laughs) Yeah, man, that's, that's the question. So we talked about this with Genesis one, two, and three, that there's really not a timeline. They're not trying to give us like a scientific historical breakdown of, uh, what happened, you know, before the flood or in creation or any of that. Yeah. Um, the only clue we get is that it says when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them. Mm-hmm. So if you picture the bookends for um, this, it, it, it could take us all the way back to Cain because it says when man began to multiply on the face of the earth. And so again, Cain and his descendants are kind of the kind of the catalyst for all the the evil and the wickedness that the Lord is is observing in this passage. Yeah, uh, I would also say with with a big heaping help of verse four there. Yes, I think I think the Nephilim, which we're going to talk about, and who they are and what they're doing, and um, they're they're an offspring of what we see, you know, in, in verses one through three. And uh, that, you know, the, the fact that these sons of God, which I'll just make a note real quick, the sons of God, there's a view out there that's the predominant view is that there's nothing supernatural going on here. Mm-hmm. The sons of God are just the, the godly line of Seth. And, you know, they're marrying the daughters of Cain. And then that's the whole stink here, uh, which... I think we'll see doesn't make sense, but sons of God there, the B'nai Elohim, like every time that phrase is used in the Old Testament, every time it is referring to angelic, divine gods of his counsel. Yeah, in the Old every Testament. Every time. Yeah. It's never used of humans until the New Testament. Right. Then we adopt that phrase of sons of God We've been made sons and daughters of God. Yeah. With the idea of we're, we've been ad, uh, adopted into this heavenly family. And so he gives us this title that was only meant, especially in the Old Testament, for this divine council idea, these, these members of the divine council. Yeah. So we've been brought into his council in the New Testament. We're partakers with him is the whole idea. Uh. Yeah, and there's some interesting parallels when you get into the New Testament about the redemption of creation. Yeah. And, you know, it says that all, uh, I believe it's in Romans, right, when it says all creation groans for the day that the sons of God will be revealed. Yeah. Right? And so there, it kind of goes back to Adam, the idea that he, his job was to steward the earth. And it says that Adam was made in the image of God. He was a son of God. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also some connections to, um, like, again, not something we're going to pause and spend a lot of time on in this episode because it's going to come up probably in the next one. But, you know, if you've grown up in the church, I guess depending on what denomination or or tradition you're from. 90% of them. (laughs) Yeah. You may have heard about, like, classes of angels, right? Ah, okay, yeah. And so, again, we talked about in our first couple episodes about divine beings and how angel is not like a species. Angel is like a job title. Right, yes. And so you have Elohim, you have these spirit beings, Mm -hmm. and some of them are messengers, and that word for messenger in the Old Testament is malak, Mm -hmm. and that's the Hebrew word, and the Greek word is anhelos, so that's where we get angel from. Um, But, you know, the 
church history, church tradition over time has kind of identified different classes of angels. And one of them is uh, virtues, which is really interesting because they are over creation itself, Mm -hmm. if I understand right. Like they're associated with like nature. Um, Last week we talked about Ra carrying like the Egyptian myth that he carries the sun in a boat, right? Uh, And that he travels through the sky and then he travels through the underworld and all that. Well, they had a similar idea that that the sun, moon, and stars, that all of creation was kind of governed by these spirits. They right. they worked, they helped maintain order in creation for Yahweh. Right. And again, not that Yahweh needs help, right. but he creates these beings and then involves them. He puts them to work right. for him. And, and, and you see that alluded to like in, in the beginning of Job. Yeah, where the where the Satan figure, you know, not Satan, the devil from the Garden of Eden, but a, a, a figure, a yeah. divine being comes to God and God questions him. OK, what have you been doing? You know, give me. OK, what you know, what's your your thing for today? What have you been up to? Yeah. You know, tell me everything that's going on. And he's like, I've been going across the earth. There's, evidently, there's this job description to go to and fro across the earth. Yeah. You know, observing things to gain, you know information, not that God needs that information, you know, and it has this concept of, uh, you know, books in heaven, right? It's this idea that God doesn't miss anything. Yeah. You know, he's keeping a record, he has a record, not necessarily that he has physical books there, but well, that, might, but. that also, that also plays in historically. That's an image of, of kingship because yeah. think about like, uh, is it the book of Esther when it talks about his scribes would read back the events yeah, of the day. Yeah, yeah. That that was very common for kings to have right. everything recorded. So if you're if you're like at a job, you know, where you have to have a daily meeting, yeah, you know, yeah, or a yeah. weekly meeting. It's like the okay. minutes. All right, <laughs> what have you been working on? You know, yeah, okay, yeah. So it's like that. Um, but yeah, just this 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 interesting thing about the sons of God coming down. Like this is huge. Yeah, this is a huge part of the story. And the eyes of the Lord. Since you mentioned Job, right. oh, Job is actually really interesting because. Uh, later in Job, when the Lord is speaking, he says that the, that the stars and the, yeah. the sons of God rejoiced yeah. at creation. Rejoiced. So, so they, they are, they're involved there. And, um, yeah. and even in, in parts of like Psalm, like Psalm 82 and Deuteronomy 32, those big divine counsel passages. Yeah. The, and this, I think Psalms 89 also, right? Psalm 89, that one, yeah, um, that was the other one I was going to mention. He talks about the holy ones yeah. that, you know, are part of the council. They're ruling with him in the skies, it says, you know, and it's like, well, they have these people that push back with the Sethite view. Oh, well, these are just human judges, you know, or they're, they're Jewish rulers. And well, I, I don't remember God setting up human rulers, you know, in reigning, the sky. And reigning in heaven with him. Yeah, you know? it's it like, says in the sky. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's or, this, or in the case of Job, at, at creation. Right, they, exactly. Humans so weren't there. that just completely, to, to, to my satisfaction, throws out the idea of the Sethi view. Yeah, I'm trying to pull up. uh, And it goes back to, sorry, it goes back to like what Peter said. He talks about the angels that sinned and they're being held in chains, you know, in gloomy darkness down in Tartarus. The only place that any place could have angels sinning is is Genesis 6. Yeah. Well, Jude, Jude and first Peter Right, both address that. Yep. And so we definitely need to spend time on those passages later. Yeah. Um, but it, it specifically mentions Noah being righteous mm-hmm. in context of the angels being in chains of chains and in darkness. Right. And so Jude and Peter linked the idea of Noah with the judgment of these beings. Right. And so yeah, there's only one place in the Bible where that happens. And it's funny that when Peter talks about them being in chains down in Tartarus, that's not in the Old Testament. Yeah. That's found in the Surprise. book of Enoch. Yeah. So that tells us that Peter was very influenced and very read up on the book of Enoch. So was Jude. Yeah. That's Jesus' brother. Well, and I believe there's even times like in, uh, it seems like Romans or Galatians, Paul makes very vague references to Enoch. And I mean, Paul was like a well, he was a Pharisee. So he was well-trained. We mentioned it last time about the head covering thing where he mentions, you know, it was a sexual thing to them in that time, the the head covering thing, hair and all that stuff. Yeah, because hair was associated with... uh, We'll talk about with reproduction. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that too. That sounds really weird, but it's true. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Their idea of, of of reproduction back then was associated with hair and the length and how that works. And, but yeah, so head coverings, you know, Paul is just 
throws that phrase out there, you know, we're, we're doing this to mod, you know, we need to show modesty because of the angels. Yeah. And it's like, what? That doesn't make sense if, if you don't know this story. Yeah. Um, I thought about this. I had to look it up. But when we were talking about the stars and the angels being associated with nature and creation mm-hmm. and all that, um, in Deuteronomy 4, when Moses is given the law to Israel and he's kind of setting up all these statutes, mm-hmm. um, he says in Deuteronomy 4, he's like, don't, you know, don't worship the likeness of anything. He says, remember what happened to you at Horeb. And I b- believe that's the reference to the calf, right? Mm. And he says, uh, that's the one where Aaron said, I threw all this stuff in the fire. And now came, came this, this calf. calf. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> Moses was like, I'm not stupid. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, that story makes sense when you kind of think about the biblical Idolatry. We talked about biblical idolatry. I'm, I don't want to. We don't have time for it now. Right. But that's an interesting and topic too, because everybody that, thinks Aaron must have thought Moses was stupid. Out came this calf. Right. Yeah. But like the way that they believed about spirits and stuff, mm. he probably he might have believed that an image of a calf came to them like that, mm, or yeah. from Egypt. Could the be. calf represented certain things yeah, too. And then gold know? is from space. And so gold is space, from space. Is a space cow. Gold is is a holy. Space calf. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, the space calf? The space Wait, calf. Is there something there? I don't know. There could be. Ask Timothy Alberino if there's Shoot, any cows dude, in Alberino's space. Got, he's got an awesome theory on everything. Um, but anyway, okay, so Deuteronomy 4, he says, don't worship the likeness of any of like humans or any animals or anything. Right. And he says in 419, uh, and beware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the hosts of heaven, mm. that you be drawn away and bow down and serve them. And then it's, he says, things that the Lord, your God, has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. Mm-hmm. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of Egypt to be a people of his own inheritance. And that kind of mirrors the Deuteronomy 32 thing, yeah. that like the nations were put under the sons of God, but Israel was was the Lord's portion. Right. So here, here he says, don't, he says, beware if you look up to heaven and see the sun, moon, and stars and the hosts of heaven, don't bow down to them. That the other nations do that. Mm-hmm. That's not for you. Right. Like he he straight up says it here. So there's obviously this association with spiritual beings and nature. Right. You know. Yep. So let's let's take a couple minutes if we can and really break down what this is and what it means. I think it's such an important topic, and we're definitely gonna have to do extra episodes on it. But in this scenario, we have divine beings members of God's council, like his team, he has breakaway beings that are rebelling. Yeah. And we can speculate, and of course we can get into the book of Enoch, but they have the idea that we're going to go down to earth and we're going to take females, human females, and we're going to procreate with them. Yeah. And they have an offspring called this Nephilim thing. Yeah. And the biblical text doesn't give us much to go on. It gives us a pretty good bit when we start connecting the dots. But Enoch is where we really get a lot of the details. Right. And like we said a minute ago, Enoch, we're not saying that the book of Enoch is inspired like scripture, but it's definitely helpful and profitable. It does give us context. The way Peter, Paul, and Jude, and some say even Jesus... Uh, yeah. quote it and like we said a minute ago how Peter claimed that the angels were in chains and stuff like that that's only in Enoch not anywhere else so he was definitely getting his yeah theological cues from Enoch which is interesting yeah well the book of Enoch is a second temple Jewish right. literature. Right, so in between so, the Old and New Testament we have writings yeah. going on and Enoch is one of those right so for the audience we believe that was it 400 years i think four or 500 years in between the testaments yeah I so like say. malachi people believe like if you just right. read the bible that we have right. the most common version of it malachi is the end, is of, the the end of the old testament and then yeah. the gospels pick up with the birth of jesus yeah or birth Matthew, of john the baptist yeah. right before that right, right, right. right um so yeah so there's a whole period of jewish history that's left out of the modern canon, bible yeah, yeah canon um, and we're not criticizing that. We're just saying um, you get passages like Jude and Peter and some some random inferences by or uh, uh, things by Paul yeah. that 
they're familiar with these passages. They're reading these books. Because that was what people were reading when they were alive. Right. And again, Paul, who is a Pharisee, so he's very educated. He would have been very familiar with this, right. these, these books. So, so we're not saying treat, treat Enoch or any of these other books. Like we may mention Jubilees at some point mm-hmm. and, you know. Jasher. Uh, and yeah, well, that's a, that's a completely different. Yeah. There's some fun stuff in Jasher. But there's, there's other books that people refer to in Judaism and in Christianity. Right. And they're not necessarily inspired. They don't necessarily right. belong don't in the canonical. The yeah. Right. But they give us context. They do, yeah. And so, I mean, you could argue that the only thing we need to know about Enoch is what's in Jude and Peter. Here's but a, here's it's still a, fun to know the whole story. Right. Here's a good example of how books like Enoch have been demonized when they don't need to be. But yet books like Josephus are widely used and accepted with no problems. You know, G- Josephus was a, a Roman yeah. historian that actually gives us detail about uh, extra biblical, uh, outside of the Christian church, historical reference of Jesus mm-hmm. being Christos, mm-hmm. you know, being, uh, executed by the Romans. And that's such a helpful piece of information that Josephus wrote down for us, you know, because you have people that are like, well, I don't believe the Bible. It's like, okay, well, here's a, here's a Roman historian yep. who was not part of Jesus's group that references him, you know, and, and that you have that historical anchor there that's good to use. Uh, so the book of Enoch is the same way. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, it's really interesting. And we actually, some of the questions that we got in, on Instagram from listeners, I think one was about the book of Enoch. Yeah. And one was about the person Enoch. Enoch. himself, yeah. So, um, so we will probably address those at the end of this episode today. Cool. Um, but yeah, so so the book of Enoch, we'll probably spend a whole episode on it giving context to this story because again, when this was written, when Genesis 6 was written by Moses or whoever you believe wrote it, mm-hmm. they did not provide every single detail because right. they're not writing to an audience 4,000 years after they right. lived, you know? Right. Like you have to imagine Moses leaving, uh, or the children of Israel leaving Egypt would have happened in like 1,000 B.C. or or right right after that. I don't remember the exact date. Yeah. But just to, again, just to give people the idea, like this was three or 4,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. And so they're not like, oh, I need to, I need to explain this in case someone in America is reading this right, in English. Exactly, you know, yeah. like that's not how they think. They think I'm writing this because um, we mentioned polemic mm-hmm. multiple times. Yeah. So this is, this is uh, the, the Israelites interacting with the cultures around them and and really confronting the beliefs of the right. surrounding cultures. Right. And so they're like, when we go into the promised land, we're going to be surrounded by Canaanites, Babylonians. Giants. You know, yeah, <laughs> by giants. Yeah. yeah, we have to know why these people are bad. Right. Why don't we follow right. their gods? Why don't we do what they do? Yeah. And so they have, they're writing Genesis, like, we at Genesis one, and we talked about Tiamat. We talked about the Babylonian Chaos, myth. We talked yeah. about Egypt, yeah. about their myths, and so the Bible. You know, uh, it's it's kind of dangerous. We want to take everything literally mm-hmm. in the Bible, and I'm not here to tell you that you can't. That's not what I'm going to do. Yeah. But don't forsake the symbolic and the literary value of Genesis. Yeah. Because you're trying to force it to be literal. I think I think really the symbolic and literary value or historical uh, cultural value, I'll say it that way, cultural value, is really more important than trying to take it literally. Mm-hmm. And so, for instance... Um, and it could be both. And it can be both, <laughs> yes. God can speak the world into existence, right. but it can also be a polemic against Egypt and Babylon's right, right. creation myths, you know? Um, yeah, so just don't try to force things to be literal. And so one of the one of the good examples of that is the cr- chronologies, the um, the you know this person begat this person begat this person, right. and they lived this many years. There's very good evidence. Um, you know, there's really two there's two camps on this, and right. both have really good evidence. Yeah. But if you believe those are literal ages, and you you say, oh, young Earth, right? I'm a young Earth creationist because if you add up all the ages of the people right. in Genesis one through eleven. You get this, yeah. this many thousands of years. Two thousand years, yeah. Um, <laughs> Six thousand years. Go, I, I, I would challenge you. Go look up 
what old earth creationists say right. about those ages. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot in Hebrew. Um, their language, of course, is very different from ours. Their number system, they use the same characters for letters and for numbers. Yeah. And so a lot of numbers in the Bible are actually symbolic because like for instance when we get to Enoch we'll talk about him being the seventh from Adam yeah and his his um the word seven represents completeness mm-hmm. because the letters in Hebrew are the same letters in the word complete mm. And so we'll talk about the importance of that. But just as an example, I think every Christian has been taught that from the pulpit. Yeah. Well, the number yeah. of completion, seven the days of, of creation. Hallelujah. But but like there's some there's some really serious math going on with the ages of these people. Yeah. And so whether you take it literally or not, they have a symbolic value. Mm-hmm. I am not smart enough to explain that. I'll just come out and say it right yeah. now. <laughs> we'll just give that over to a guest speaker if we ever I, get a guest. On I the would show. love to have somebody come on and explain <laughs> Hebrew math. And the importance of these, the ages and stuff in this. But I'm, mm. I'm just saying, like, like you can be a young earth creationist. That's how they get it. They add up all these ages and they say, well, all the way back to Adam is only this many thousands of years. Yeah. But there are people who are creationists that do not believe in a young earth because they believe that these numbers have symbolic values. Yeah. And another reason they're in there is because um, there are historical, ar- like archaeologists have found writings from other cultures, like from Sumerian cultures, Mm -hmm. like the Sumerian kings list. And this is something you might never hear about in church on a Sunday. No, you will not. (laughs) But the Sumerian kings list gives the names of kings and like the, um, basically the strength of their cities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and so a lot of people believe that the names and the ages in Genesis are meant to line up with the Sumerian kings list Mm. to say that like, you know, Oh, the the that group over there, they believe that King so and so did this, King so and so was his son and he did this and King so and so did this. Well, in the Hebrew Bible that's Adam, Seth, mm. e, uh Enosh, like yeah, uh, yeah. they believe that the the names and numbers in the Bible are supposed to line up line with the names with and numbers those, in yeah. other historical documents. Right. Very fascinating topic. Yeah. So anyway, so I'm just I'm just saying like if we say something if we say something in the next couple episodes on when we say something when we that's say something, wrong or sounds weird. <laughs> we, we are focusing on the symbolic and cultural value of what we're reading here. Yeah. And we're, we're like, we're not going to try to prove young earth or anything like that. That's not what we're doing in these, right, in the next right. few episodes. That's your job. So, yeah, <laughs> dude, I'm just saying it's really, and I really find that stuff more interesting because, um, the, like just taking everything literal is too easy. I, I'll it's, be honest. Yeah. That's my problem. With well, you it. get in a lot of sticky situations too. Yeah. When you take stuff too literal. So sometimes. I don't. I don't mind people doing that. People do that in like the Book of Revelation too. I'll, I'll give you a good example. Since we yeah. talked about worshiping the sun, moon, and stars, right? Deuteronomy four. I just mm-hmm. read that. Um, people talk about like in the end times about the sun, moon, and stars falling away and going black, and turning to blood. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you right now. Shout out to all the blood moon uh, followers out there. <laughs> So the sun, moon, and stars is a symbolic, it's a symbol for the nation of Israel. Mm. Think about Joseph's dream. He was surrounded by the sun, moon, and stars, right? Yeah. Um, And so that's just one example that I have off the top of my head. But whenever you see, um, like in Revelation or in one of the prophets, and it talks about the sun, moon, and stars turning dark or whatever, a lot of times it's it's talking about the destruction of Israel mm-hmm. or, you know, or something bad happening to Israel. Right. It may not literally mean the sun turning black. Right. It can. Right. But I'm just saying, like, like I, to me, the symbolic meaning of that is is way more valuable in understanding the, the biblical narrative. Right. Right. Than forcing it to be literal. Well, even the writer of Revelation, which was John, I believe, uh, he, he talks about you know in the in the beginning chapters he talks about you know the stars and the lampstands and yeah and then he goes into like here's what this means because he gives you all this symbology of like stars and lamps and stuff yeah. that's going on you know that he's seeing in a vision it's a vision and then he's like here's what this means the lampstands and the stars and all those are churches and jesus is walking amongst the churches and it's and like and he, he gives angels. the interpretation of right. it like and so like when the writer is telling you these things are symbolic, we should probably listen. Yeah. And not take everything yeah. so literally, especially in the book of Revelation. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'm just saying it can be literal. I'm just saying Apache helicopters. 
Right. Well, that's that's another good example. <laughs> and tanks. Like, oh man, John is describing a helicopter and missiles and yeah. stuff, and it's like, you know, I'm not going to say he's uh, not, but sure. there's a like what John does in Revelation. He's quoting Old Testament prophets. Yeah. And so, what was the meaning of that symbol in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament. And I was just talking to a buddy this morning. And he was saying something about, you know, he's like, man, I just don't understand the Old Testament very much. He's like, but I really, he's like, I really like the New Testament. I'm like, well, bro, if you don't understand the Old Testament, there's no way you're going to yeah. understand the New. Yeah. Not correctly, at least. You might get a lot of it, but man, there's so many details that you'll miss because it's deliberately coming from the Old Testament. Yeah. Actually, since we're talking about Revelation, the Mark of the Beast is another perfect example because of what we beep, need. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> like, is it a microchip? Is it a stamp? Is it a tattoo? Of course it's a microchip. Is it a credit card? We were told that years ago. Yeah. R, what was it? RFID chip? Yeah, RFID <laughs> is a big deal now, man. You can walk in a store and it scans your, yeah. your phone. And, you know, I'm just saying, like, it can be literal. It can be a literal mark. It can, yeah. But we're going to talk about Cain in a minute. Mm-hmm. And God puts a, puts a mark on Cain. And it people make mark. People make the same question about Cain. Was it a literal physical mark or was it symbolic? Mm. And I think in both cases, I think it's a reference to the same thing. Like I think the mark, the, like in Revelation, God's people get marked right. and then the beast people get exactly. marked. They and it's get a mark. It, whether, I, I don't, it doesn't have to be literal to be important. The symbolic meaning is actually more important. What if that was the beginning of the barcode? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So it's like every time you scan a cereal box, you, you scan uh, cane that says like fault or like error. Well, Josh taught me a little while ago error. that cereal is actually pagan because it's from the Roman God series. Dude, so ser- yeah. If you scan a barcode on a cereal box, you're worshiping, yeah, you're uh, worshiping the, the beast. God of grains and offerings. And, yeah. <laughs> that is how cereals and grains. Yeah. That's how <laughs> we that's, do not endorse that idea. We're that's just when you fun stay now. up a little too late on YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> it is interesting though. You stay up till four a.m. and, you st- <laughs> and you're half awake, and you're like, <laughs> like "Wait, what, what if uh, cereal is pagan?" Whoa. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, more <laughs> on more on pagan cereal later. All right. How far are we going to go into like the sons of God and the Nephilim and who they are and what they are and? Hmm. I I think what we should do right now is discuss the. Um, you want to go back. You want to back up to Cain. Let's. I do I, yeah. because I want context. I think maybe right, in the right, next right. episode we go into the sons of God and the Nephilim and stuff. Cool. But let's give context mm-hmm. right now. So Genesis six again. It's only eight verses long. What we ju- the portion we just read. The portion that covers the sons of God and the Nephilim. Right. And the purpose for the flood. It, it says that it's because the the men every intention of their heart was wicked. Yeah. How that happened. So the only the only clue we get as far as timeline is. Uh, when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, which we know is after Adam and Eve started having kids. Mm -hmm. So Cain and Abel being the first kids, right? The first children born on earth. Mm -hmm. Um, It says, uh, I've got Eve in Genesis 4-1, that she uh, had gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Yeah. And uh, that doesn't, some people will tell you that that, I'm not even going to go there, never mind. Uh, (laughs) It's no. a really bad view where some ideas are really squeezed into yeah. this text. People come but, up with some crazy stuff. Man. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's okay, but bad. It's, it says that she had some help. Uh, she she bore Cain, and then she bore his brother Abel, and it says Abel was a keeper of sheep, and let's, Cain was a worker of the ground. Let's just point out the first couple of words in the verse there. Now the man, who was Adam. Knew his wife. Had <laughs> marital relations <laughs> with his wife. And yeah. then... The product was Cain yeah. and Abel. <laughs> okay. There yeah. you go. That should so demolish, all, very the, clear uh, how demolish this all the conspiracies, um, <clears throat> as fun as they are, but oh well. So I think that uh, it's important to point out here that it says Cain was a worker of the ground. We know that that's what Adam did, right? That's what humans did. Yeah. Adam worked in the garden, and when he was cast out, God said, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, blah, blah, blah. So in the garden, fruit was falling off trees for them, but mm. now they have to work for it. Right, now they got to work right? their butts off. And uh, it's interesting that, it, that we were using the word curses in the previous episodes, but really Adam and Eve, it doesn't say that they were cursed. It does say the ground was cursed right. because of them. And it says the serpent was cursed. Yeah. Which, here's a fun fact. Again, because we don't read it in Hebrew, we miss some of the brilliance of the Hebrew language. Yeah. So there's actually a play on words there in the curse of the serpent, because in Genesis three, it says that the serpent was 
Um, let me find it real quick. All I right. wrote it down. I'll see it a says song that while we wait. Oh, you got the it. The serpent okay. in Genesis 3 was, he was more crafty than any other beast, right? Yeah. That word is arum. 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 Okay. Arum. So he was, he was crafty, arum, and the word for curse is arar. Uh, arar. Arar. That's so a lot I'm not, of rolling R's there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I'm just, because I'm from Louisiana, I'm just going to say arum and arar. Arum and arar. <laughs> but it is, it's a play on words because at the beginning of the chapter when he deceives these, it, it says that the serpent was more arum. Mm-hmm. And then the Lord says, you are arar. Mm. He's cursed. It's like, oh, you think you're smart? Yeah. No, you're dumb. So I thought that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Um, again, there's a lot of things like that in Hebrew. A lot of uh, a lot of names. A lot of wordplay. There's a lot of yeah, wordplay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the word Nimrod. When we get to Genesis 11, yeah. Nimrod is actually a, a not a made up name. It's actually an insult about a real king. Right. That existed. And we um, still use that today yeah. as a euphemism of being stupid. Yep. You yep. Nimrod. Nimrod. So Pretty anyway. Yeah, very interesting. I stuff. have a question slash theory that came up last night when I was studying about Cain. Um, okay. And that's going to get into like their offerings, so maybe I'll hold on to it until we get to well, yeah, that spot. That's the next part. Okay, that's yeah. where we're going. Well, let's go ahead and talk about what happened, and then we can give our okay. opinions, I guess. Well, verse three says, uh, "In the course of time, he brought an offering to the Lord, or he brought an offering to the Lord." Of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought an offering of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. I'm reading ESV, by the way. Okay, yeah. um, My personal favorite. Uh, And it says, uh, so Cain was very angry, and his face fell, and the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Mm. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Mm. Does that sentence sound familiar, yeah. by the way? Mm-hmm. You remember what he said to Eve? Yep. Your desire will be contrary to your husband, but yep. he will rule over it's you. It's going to be conflict. So, yeah, it's just interesting. Again, it's literature. He's, using a, he's making a theme here. Um, sin wants one thing that's opposed to Cain's desire. Right. And Cain's he says, you must conquer it. You must rule over and it, And I basically. love the fact that God is warning him here. Yeah. And, and I don't see it being like a, how dare you? How could you do you know, how it? How dare like, you? It was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Greta's face from the heavens came down. How dare you, Cain? No, but it's like this loving father. Like, yeah. hey, look, dude, like, you're going in a wrong direction. Let's let's change course, you know. Um, you know what's also important here? Let, I'll point this out because we spent a lot of time talking about the embodied Yahweh in yeah. the last episode mm-hmm. that God was in person interacting with Cain yeah. or a, a Adam and Eve and the serpent. Right. Um, this is another one where I grew up reading this and thinking God was yelling from the clouds, mm-hmm. but there's no reason to believe God's not standing there in person. Sure. And it kind of makes more sense. Like to me, uh, he says, Oh yeah, I'll take Abel's offering, but I'm not going to take Cain's and Cain was probably ticked off. Yeah. And he's, he probably walked over and was like, Cain, buddy, don't you know if you do good? Put his arm around yeah. him. Look, man. It's like, just way more interesting to read this as a God in person. Right, and I really right. think that that's what the, I think that's what the ancient Israelites would have probably would, thought of. How, yes. how they would have thought of this. Yeah. Well, you see that in all the mythologies. Yeah. Greek mythology, especially, you know, the gods come down in person yep. and talk to people. That's going to happen um, a lot. Well, even we in the Bible, but, you know, the, the angel of the Lord, we see that a ton of yeah, places. Interacted with Adam and Jacob. And Jesus Moses comes and, down. Well, I'll say Jesus because that's what I think it is. Yeah. The angel of the Lord wrestles with Jacob. Yeah. And like he talks to they have Moses a big UFC face face battle in the middle of the he, desert, uh, you know? <laughs> Yeah, man. So yeah, we see and this the all the Stargate over, so. opens and all the angels are coming up and down. Like, yeah, yeah but, they're uh, beaming up and down like. But Star let's Trek. back up to verse three. Like, okay, so what's this offering that they're doing? Like, where yeah. does that come in? Where did that idea come from? So I think it's safe to assume that Adam and Eve probably had passed this down to them. I mean, they taught their kids, so their kids learned it from them. Yeah, I have I have two theories in researching this. There's two theories that I have that I kind of like on this. One of them is what you're saying. Right. If we believe in Genesis 3 that the garments of skin that we talked about in the previous episode, mm-hmm. go back and listen to episode 7 if you haven't, mm-hmm. uh, listeners. But the garments of skin, if that was a symbol for, uh, for Jesus' sacrifice, sacrifice, for atonement, yeah. right. um, then <laughs> Adam, Cain and Abel probably would have learned the story about their parents from their parents. They probably would have been like, right. we used to live in the garden with, yeah. in, with, in God's presence. Here's what happened. 
And so Cain and Abel probably knew about sacrifice. Um, and, you know, we've, you may say, well, there's no, there's no context. There's no, no precedent or prerequisite or anything. There's nothing in the story of Genesis yet to say that they need an atonement sacrifice. Right. There was no command given that yeah. was like, they have to do this, but it yeah. was something that they felt they needed to do because they, they're doing it. They may have, Adam and Eve and may have done it ritually. Right. Right. And I, I even think about like in the book of Job, it says that, that Job's sons and daughters would have parties and drink and eat and whatever. Mm -hmm. And Job would go and it says, um, as was his custom. Yeah. It, it says There's a lot of those uh, phrases in the, in the Bible. Job would, would consecrate them and he would rise early in the morning. He'd pray for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it says he would offer burnt offerings according to the mm -hmm. number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and yeah, cursed God yeah. in their hearts. And it says he did it continually. That's Job uh, 1, 6. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Job, th I think Job's a good example. Like Job just goes and offers sacrifices just, just in case. Yeah. Like, it's it's his way to sacrifice honor sacrifice was the way to communicate and to deal with yeah. divine beings. And see, that's another thing, too, that we don't have context for in the modern world, especially as New Covenant Christians, because we don't offer sacrifices. No. But sacrifice wasn't just a ritual where you kill an animal, you drain the blood, the end. Right. Like, it was a meal. Right. It, right. You, you ate in the presence of your deity. Mm hmm. And uh, think about Moses on Mount Sinai. He and the 70 elders ate in the presence of God. Mm. And uh, there's in like I Leviticus like and stuff. Yeah. So I like those verses. <laughs> yeah. I like the verse where he prepares a table before me. Oh, yeah. He, he like lays, yep. out, lays out Chick-fil-A for yep. you. And milk and honey. And, <laughs> but honey, yeah, there's, honey, rules, chicken tenders. there's rules in the, in the law in the Old Testament about how they were to treat the meat of sacrifices. The priests had to eat it within right. a certain the number of days and yada, yada, yada. And all that, yeah. They couldn't throw some of it away. And they that could, was some of the issue with some of the New Testament Christians that were eating sacrifice meat. Yeah. And they had a problem with that in their conscience. Yeah. Like, man, we shouldn't be eating this meat that was yeah. sacrificed to these idols. And Paul's like, well, no, that's not really a thing. Exactly. Like, they saw okay. it as interacting with right. that spirit. It, it was exactly. They were sharing a meal with, exactly. just like, it was just like with my just family. Food. Like, you, you all gather around the table together and eat. They, they pictured this is a meal we're having with our God. Right. You know, right. or our, our spirit, our deity. And whatever. then we see that with, you know, what Christians call the Lord's Supper or communion. Yeah. There's a reason it's called communion. Yes. Because we're communing with the and God. Since it, <laughs> and since it thing. was um, when Jesus did that and he said uh, it was the Passover meal, right? Mm -hmm. Which was them remembering the angel that Exodus, went, in, yeah. which was Jesus, ironically, mm -hmm. right? right? Yeah. Jesus is having a meal remembering when he went around and killed the firstborn of every <laughs> yeah, brutal, Egyptian. Bro. Yeah, the angel uh, of the Lord. Yeah. Think about that. Anyway, Actually, I think it says the destroying angel. The destroying that's, angel. That's heavy metal, yes. bro. Yeah. So, again, there's Jesus different... Jesus listens to heavy metal. That's all I can say. There's... <laughs> the well, there's different angel. interpretations on, on the destroying angel, but one of them right. is that it was the second person of the Trinity. It was the angel of Yahweh. Right, the angel of the Lord. Which would have been Jesus right. in the New Testament. Come on. So, yeah, so very interesting. But he's, he's saying this is a Passover meal where we're recognizing our Lord, right, and what he's done for us. And as he's distributing the food, he's saying, this is my body mm -hmm. that's given up for you because he was the sacrifice. And by partaking in Jesus' sacrifice, we are brought into the family of God, right? right. That he, he is the mediator. He's the meal that brings us together. Right. We are recognizing that Jesus and what he did is fulfilling all of these Old Testament laws of yep. sacrifice, of yep. ritual, of clean and unclean. All of that is not gone it's still on the books. Like yeah. God's word lasts forever, right? But Jesus has checked the box. Yeah. So we don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. So with, with that image of a meal, that sacrifices are a meal. Yeah. Now picture Cain and Abel. Yeah. They have God there in person. And Cain brought veggies. Abel brought meat. And Abel provided the the the, the main protein. course, yeah. and uh, yeah, he, Cain was the side uh, dishes. He was picking up the side dishes, the the mashed potatoes at Walmart. So this is where 
this is where um okay, okay so what we were saying earlier was if you believe that so Adam does, and Eve, does God just not like vegetables? Okay, so yes, <laughs> that's that's the question I was going to go to. There are sacrifices in the Old Testament that are vegetables, right? Grain offerings. Yeah. There's yeah, all like even atonement sacrifices Incense that are vegetables. Offerings. Uh, there's yeah. all kind of offerings. So yeah. you know, we believe we kind of jump to the whole without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for right, sin, which right? came way later, right? But there were part of atonement sacrifices that were vegetable or grain or right, whatever. Right, those were acceptable. So, so anyway, if you take that track that like Adam and Eve, if the garments of skin was a symbol for atonement, then maybe Cain and Abel were doing some sort of sacrifice here, and then Cain would have required a live animal because there had to be blood, there had to be death. Right. So that would be that route if you believe that that's atonement, and that's why Cain wasn't accepted. Right. Here's the other theory. Right. I think this is probably the theory we might hang our hat on. Yeah, so here's the other theory. I, I'm, now I'm stuck on the the family dinner image. Can't, what is Abel around brought, lunchtime? We record around lunchtime, yeah. so <laughs> when I come in here, I'm thinking about food because I haven't eaten yet. Well, so I'm like, so, ooh, crispy chicken tenders. Yeah, <laughs> man, I had some chicken enchiladas that my wife made that today. Sounds, sounds ooh, good, man. It brings us together. Chicken enchiladas brings my family ooh, together, man. Chicken. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah. So picture a family meal. Abel brought sheep, or he brought veal, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cain brought veggies. And the Lord here basically said, "I'll eat with Cain, but I, I'll I'll eat with Abel, but I'm not going to eat with Cain." Mm. So now, now the now the atonement image kind of falls apart right. because it's not about atonement sacrifice. Picture like if there's disunity in a family, you don't like like picture you know the classic Hallmark movie or you know Christmas movie where. Uh, People don't like to eat together at Christmas because Uncle So and So did something crazy and blah blah blah, you know. Uh, so that's kind of what's happening here. Is basically there's a meal going on and he says I'll accept Abel's food, but I won't accept Cain's. Right. So if why then why wouldn't he accept Cain's offering? What do you think about the terminology here that I'm looking at? So in verse four it says at the designated time. I'm reading from the NET, but. There was a designated time for this. So this was something they would, they would do, you know, at yeah, certain times. Time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> dinner time, yeah. I don't know. They ring the bell out there. No, but at a, at a certain time, which, which gives the illusion of like, okay, this is something we do periodically or, or whatever. Cain brought some of the fruit of the ground. So he just, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll just bring some of my stuff. But then in verse 4 it says, but Abel brought some of the firstborn of yeah. his flock. There seems like there's a little bit of difference there yeah, from so, some stuff that he had and then the firstborn of his flock. So that, I think that is important. I will say, though, that may or may not be important to the actual question itself. Okay. Because the idea of the firstborn from the flock, what we infer from that is actually based on the law of Moses, right? True. Yeah. So that that has not been established. But there is no yet. law of Moses at that time. So it, it could be. It, now they would have understood the value of the firstborn. They don't need the law of Moses to know that. Right. Right. Yeah. So so that could be part of it. Yeah. Because I've heard that theory of like, well, Abel gave his best. He gave his best. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that too. I. You know, that may be part of it. But what if it was the best vegetables? He had like a huge watermelon don't know. he brought to the yeah, again, table. I'm, I'm reading in the ESV, and it just says, in the course of time, <laughs> he brought an offering of fruit. It doesn't say like right, right, right. some fruit So what is the issue? So here's, here's the other theory that I've stumbled upon that I kind of like is um, if we look at the New Testament actually talks about Cain a lot. Mm-hmm. And it, and it kind of makes sense. Again, if we believe that they thought everything's kind of his fault instead of Adam and Eve, mm-hmm. um, Hebrews 11 says, by faith. Abel offered God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, uh, and for that he was committed righteous, and he, he accepted his gifts. Mm-hmm. So there's this, you know, the book of Hebrews right there in 11, that's the, that's the faith chapter, right? The heroes of the faith. And it lists all these people that are before Jesus, but it says they're still considered righteous because of their faith. Mm-hmm. And so we see that it's not any adherence or obedience to a law. It's your relationship. It's I believe in God, and he, has, faith in God. he shows favor to me. Right. So this is saying that basically Abel had a healthy relationship with the Lord, right. and Cain did not. Cain did not. First John 3, uh, I'll just read. Uh, okay, so it says in 11, verse 11 and 12, the message you've heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Verse 12 says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And that's where people think Cain was 
not Adam's son, right? The serpent seed. Yeah, more on serpent seed later. <laughs> but uh, but it just says he was like the evil one and murdered his brother. Right. And it says, why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil mm-hmm. and his brothers were righteous. And it goes yeah. on to compare... John, uh, in First John, he goes on to compare he, that Abel represents the church and Cain represents the world, that the world hates you because you're righteous. Mm. Cain was of the evil one. Why? Mm. Because his deeds were evil. Yeah. Like that, plain and simple. So it makes sense. I feel like that adds all the context you need, that God did not accept Cain's sacrifice because Cain was evil. Yeah. And he, the story in Genesis chapter 4 doesn't say anything about anything that Cain and Abel did before or after. Well, Abel died. Yeah. But we don't know what Cain did before and after that. His whole life, he may have been the mischievous one that was, right. you know, and, yeah, well, and in I mean, fact, Jewish at, tradition implies that he was violent, that he stole, that he did all these awful things. Right. So that 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 could be all that you need to answer that question. Why didn't God accept Cain's sacrifice? He did evil things. Right. And Yahweh said, sorry, bud. Right. I don't think his heart was in it. Yeah. He didn't want to worship God, it seems. Yeah. Because look at verse 7 of, uh, it says... <clears throat> God tells Cain, you know, picture that father with his arm around his, you know, around his neck. Is it not true? Yeah. If you do what's right. If you do well. Yeah. yeah if you do, if what's you right. do the right thing, then you'll be accepted. Yeah. And, and it's just, it almost brings a tear to my eye. You know, being a father, it's like, yeah. I can picture like me putting my arm around my son and saying, hey, buddy, just, you know, you need to do the right thing. Yeah. You know? And do the right thing. Um, Man, that's crazy it's but good. I, I like that I and this is the this is the struggle with these very early passages in the Bible that there's not a lot of context and so we're really hunting for any clues we can possibly find to figure out the answer yeah and so I, I like that I think that the answer is simple uh, I think that it's just that Cain was evil yeah Abel was so righteous. It, it was a heart issue. Yeah. It wasn't a whether he had vegetables and, or meat or... And I can even back that up. We mentioned in the previous episode, Psalms 50 and Psalms 51, where David says, um, well, let's see, I had it right here. Uh, yeah, and pause, even, pause, even the pause. later part of that verse 7, you know, God is telling him, but if you do what's right, uh, if you don't, he says, if you don't do what's right, you know, the consequences are sin is going to overtake you. And it's going to consume your desires. Yeah, yeah. Which we see happen. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so Psalms 50, He uh, David is saying, this is where we get the creating me a clean heart, mm. like that passage, yeah. right? Everybody loves that. Well, he says, you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart or a repentant heart. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, and then we see even later in some of the, uh, I don't remember where it is, mm-hmm. but I believe it's in one of the minor prophets. He's they the priests get rebuked for for saying you observe all of the festivals and sacrifices, but basically you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. You're, you're dishonoring God by your behavior, yeah. right? They got so, that a lot from Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so we we see even in the Old Testament, it's not about the sacrifice. They right. perform these rituals, but right. God was concerned with their heart. Right. So I, I think that the same applied to Cain and Abel. Mm-hmm. I think that. I think that... So would you say that in the Old Testament, bleeding on into the New Testament, God is concerned with the heart of man? Yeah. He's yeah. not... He, he he gives us laws and he gives us boundaries. He gives us things that we need to do and take care of. But at the end of the day, he wants your heart. Yeah, man. Like he wants your heart in it. And just like anything, you, know, like you want someone to love you because they love you out of their heart, not because they buy you gifts yeah. or be nice to you and like the apostle paul even says that he says it pretty i, I brought this up to somebody one time and they were like that's so offensive so i think it's funny now but <laughs> but the apostle paul literally calls the law of the old testament the law of moses he calls it a babysitter yeah he yeah, says a taskmaster. he says basically until you could come to maturity and understand that it's always been faith faith right. has always been the key right that the law has been a babysitter and he's talking about he's saying that kids don't inherit um like when when you what's it called the like a will mm-hmm. uh, when somebody passes away, kids don't inherit the will until they, until they become of age, right? right? Right. But he says the law was your babysitter until we came of age, yeah. and he says now now we understand that faith is the way. Yeah. And so that that's what Hebrews eleven says. Abel was righteous because of his faith, and he's thousands of years before the law of Moses. Right. And so um, anyway, so, so yeah. even after God. Sp- 
speculatively putting his arm around Kane and warning him, trying to correct him. Hey, buddy, like you're going the wrong direction. Let's let's correct this. The next verse is Kane said to his brother Abel, "Let's go out in the field." Mm-hmm. And, and he and he's almost fulfilling what God had just told him. It desires to his sin desires to dominate him. Yep. Um, yep. And the Lord knew immediately. And this is the second time that word curse is used. Remember, I just said, in, or the third time, I guess, in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, weren't they, they got consequences, but it doesn't use the word curse. Mm-hmm. It says the ground was cursed because right. of Adam. And it says the serpent was cursed. Um, but here we get Cain, the Lord says, and now you are cursed from the ground. It shall no longer yield to you its strength. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we know that Cain was a worker of the ground. He had these vegetables, and now he's not going to get anything from the ground now. He's cursed from it. Right. Do you think that was a part of the frustration maybe with Cain? Was that working it seemed like, okay, I'm working with cursed tools here, and Abel's over there just petting sheep all day. I don't know, because this is, I mean, Adam, like, you know, he like, would have learned. I do think about, I was kind of sympathetic for Cain reading this story uh, yeah. I was when I was studying it, because... I think that Cain, you know, Adam worked the ground. Mm-hmm. That's what it says in Genesis 2 and 3. Right. Even after they were cast out of the garden, he had to work the ground for food. Right. So Cain would have just been doing what his dad taught him. Right. And Being the first one. So that, that's why the question about why did the Lord reject his sacrifice was so confusing to me, because it was like Cain was only doing what he was supposed to. Right, what he had but been if, taught to do. if yeah. you read between the lines, and we get that in the New Testament, that their, their belief was that Cain was evil. Mm-hmm. Well, then it... Cain may have been, he may have had plenty of veggies. He may have had plenty of food. He may have had wealth. Like he may have even been rich, yeah. but he may, but he probably came about it by the wrong means, mm-hmm. you know? And um, so, yeah. And, and we see a connection now between the curse on the ground and blood. And mm-hmm. I think about like what Laura Sanger talks about. You know, it's kind about. of funny. Oh, geez. Yeah. Let's, but that's, it says, that's it, fun it says at the ground, you'll be cursed from the ground, which opened, opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. Yeah. And so the ground was cursed because it received the blood of an innocent mm. man. So, and it says that the blood cried out. Yep. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, a point I was going to make real quick was, and this doesn't reflect on Adam and Eve. If, if you, I'm sure everyone has seen some tor- some sort of like family dynamic where kids are raised the same way. One goes good and one goes bad. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. like like some of my family. You know, it's like they were raised in a Christian home. Everything was good. Like no issues. One kid goes this way to to you know good things and being godly, and then the other sibling goes way off, gets addicted to drugs, and like you know falls into this pit of sin. It seems. So it's not a reflection on really the parenting. It's just, you know, that's how things are. People have their own choices. They go their own way. They make their own decisions. It also kind of makes sense of verse 13 and 14 after that, where Cain says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. You've driven me away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. So from from your face I shall be hidden is just in reference to the curse, that Mm -hmm. he didn't have God's favor anymore. Yeah. And the ground... He, if you take this again, take it literally and yeah. symbolically. Right. He's not going to be able to get food from the ground anymore. Mm. So he's going to die. He's it's, gonna like. Yeah, he's scary. gonna eventually starve <laughs> when, when your when your livelihood is growing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it says, "I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer." Again, yeah. that's what he was cursed with. That he would he would go out from the ground and he he would be a fugitive and a wanderer. That's what the Lord said. And he says, whoever finds me will kill me. Now, this is where people get into like co-atomism because they say there had to have been other people out there. Right. I think that if you don't, if I'm not uh, not going to critique co-atomism, mm-hmm. I'll say here's an alternative. Yeah. If somebody listening doesn't like the idea of people other than Adam's family. Yeah. The Adam's family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it, it could have been referenced to, this is cool. Adam and Eve, obviously. Adam and Eve. They yeah. may have, they would have been righteously angry, oh, you know, bet. because Cain killed their son Abel, right? How devastated do so you he, think they he, felt? This is where uh, again, Adam and Eve. We kind of see that they stayed in the Lord's favor. Cain here had an opportunity maybe to repent, but he said, "They're going to kill me if I go back." Yeah, you know. Yeah. So that's one way to look at it. Maybe siblings. Yeah, it could have been that there are other brothers other and sisters siblings? that are not named right? in yeah. Genesis four and five. 
So, um, and again, um, if you if you take it literally, you have you kind of you don't get that. But doesn't some Adam of the Eve, genealogy say Adam and Eve had sons and daughters? So there's I some, want to say that there, there, yeah. there, there might not be, but other sons and daughters. Like I thought, yeah, it seems like I thought I read that before. Um, yeah, it's probably, probably in like Chronicles before, or something. But right? <laughs> well, like we can the, we can always somewhere. look it up later. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it could have been other brothers and sisters, nephews, nieces, whatever. Yeah. Other people that you know we don't know We're when. Connected, yeah, we don't know when this happened. Right. So there could have been other people. Well, how long did Adam and Eve live? Well, like eight, nine hundred yeah. years or something crazy. There's so, lots I mean, of time for people to there's multiply. A lot of time there to yeah. pump some babies out. But here's another <laughs> idea. Oh, remember. We the whole you're, point. You're scaring me. In our you're Genesis surprising three, me here. What are you gonna say? Yeah, in our Genesis one, two, and three, we talked about the Elohim being present in the garden. Yes. What if Cain was afraid of Elohim killing him? Mm. That, so. That's an option people yeah, don't think that's about. True. Yeah. He may have come across a righteous spirit that would have. And what was the activity of all the Elohim during all of this? Maintaining order and nature. There's some uh, activity there. Which there's even some, I've heard this before too, that some people think that nature itself would have risen up Mm. against Cain, that things that are supposed to be good, like, you know, water or earth or wind or whatever, Cain was afraid that some tragedy would come upon him Mm. because he was unrighteous. That he was out of, out of the Lord's favor and something bad was going to happen. So I like, I like that idea. It could have been other humans born to Adam and Eve. It could have been Adam and Eve themselves. It could have been nature. It could have been Elohim. And, uh, it makes what the Lord says next very interesting. He says, not so if anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. So now the Lord is saying, um, I'm still going to protect you, basically. Yeah. Which is interesting because Cain. Well, it's funny. Has, it's funny that he says anyone. Yeah. So it seemed like it was maybe a personal, uh, yeah. like a person. Yeah. Or persons. Maybe so. Yeah. But I think too, like Cain. Cain may have thought if he ran across an Elohim that wanted to take vengeance, he could not. He would not be able to fight them. Mm-hmm. And God says, No. If somebody comes on you, I'm gonna get them. Yeah. So. And now I'm, I'm, that's again, that's one of the things that we're speculating. That's right. not anywhere. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's not a salvation issue. Don't worry about it. The, the word mark there. Now we get to talk about the mark. Ooh. Um, so the first time barcode was ever used in people scanning. used to, yeah. Yeah. God put a QR code on his forehead. <laughs> a QR code. Now if anybody scans his forehead, people used to take this, um, the whole descendants of Cain thing and make it very racist. I don't know if you've ever studied that. Uh, no, not, certain, not the racial thing. No. That certain races or Are groups marked. of people would have come. Yeah. Now I have heard that from Mormonism. Yeah. That people of darker skin color are, are yeah. that's a product of God Which cursing. doesn't even make sense because the flood happens after this. So right. Noah, yeah. <laughs> you know, right. everybody's a descendant of Noah, not Cain. Right. So uh, anyway, I don't know. But I, you know, it, what was it like a, phys- you know what else I think of? Have you ever seen this show Stargate? The TV show? I've heard of it. I've never the watched movie. it. I've never watched the, it. Uh, some, there's a race of aliens that had like an emblem uh, on yeah, their forehead. Their and I'm like, what if Kane had like a bing? You like know? a sweet bandana. Yeah. Like a <laughs> um, but the word the word for mark there in Hebrew is the word, coincidentally, it's pronounced oath. It's O-T, mm. but it's pronounced oath. Mm-hmm. And it means, it means a mark, but it also means like a banner, like a, a tattoo. an omen. It means an omen. So this literally could be an oath. It's not, it's not, I don't want people to be confused. It's not at all connected to the English word oath. oath it's yeah. just pronounced the it's same pronounced way. That way yeah. And they happen to mean similar things. Mm-hmm. So it might not have been a physical mark. It might have just been God made a covenant with a Cain. pronouncement yeah, over God, him. Yeah, he made an oath with Cain to take vengeance on anybody, mm. you know. So, um, and so then why Cain, was he trying to protect him? It seemed like a murderer. He would, he would, uh. Well, I, I think that it still is the same reason he spared Adam and Eve. Yeah. He he loves humans. Being gracious. He loves humans. He wants them to multiply and yeah. fill the earth. And this early in the game, there's not that many humans. Right. So you kill one of them and you eliminate like millions of people <laughs> down the line. Your you odds know? Are, yeah, dwindling. So, so God, in his grace and in his mercy, decides to spare Cain and make an oath to take vengeance on whoever would attack him. Mm. It's because really so, so humans, so people think uh, God's very cruel, but really God's being very merciful yeah, here. Very. He's like, he's like, I made a commitment to these humans. They're supposed almost, to, supposed almost to in my mind, almost to a fault. 
Now, when I well, say that, I don't yeah. say it in a demeaning way toward God, but it's like, in my mind, you know, we automatically want, yeah. we want justice, you know, well, what we think is justice. Like, yeah. oh, well, Cain should die, you know? Well, and here's the, here's the cop but out we too. we all should is, die, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's the cop out too, is that God, God already knows everything that's going to happen, right? Yeah. He's already got the whole thing planned out. Right. And we don't have time to talk about free will and all that stuff today, but. So predestination, predestination is. Predestination. Uh, but. Uh, but yeah, uh, God, Adam and Eve sinning was not a mistake that there's not like a plan B God was prepared for that. And you might've understood that in our previous episode, when we talked about the second person of the Trinity, that the word of God gave the first messianic prophecy Mm. and may have performed the first atonement sacrifice too. So like, and Hebrews, Hebrews mentions, um, those who are written, is it Hebrews? A revelation. I think it's revelation. One of those books. Those that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life from oh, yeah. before the foundations of the earth. Ooh, yeah. And so um, Calvinists like that. But they that's love not, that verse. That's not I used to be a Calvinist. For. Really? Yeah. So yeah. I, I know those verses very well. Well, it's not what they think it means, but right. <laughs> it shows that God has this plan and it says from right. before the foundations of yeah. the earth, right? Now look at verse 16. This is cool. Uh, so, like father, like son, maybe? says, so Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Yeah. So this idea of I'm Adam and Eve were expelled. They were forced out of the presence mm-hmm. of God. Now we have Cain consciously making a decision. I'm he leaving. went away. I'm leaving the presence of yeah. God. And it's funny that the presence of God is around them. Yeah. Even though they're not in the garden anymore. Well, if you think the presence of the Lord is is a name, is a title, right. then that's the being, that's so, the person. Right, so it, it's not this ethereal like cloud that he's like running away from. Yeah, it's, he got out of the dome. It's a person. Yeah, he is, yeah, the dome. Yeah. You remember that movie Biodome with Biodome. Polly Shore? Did you ever watch that one? Or uh, there's one. It's one of the Baldwin brothers. Oh, I can't ever remember what it's called. It's one it's of those really so weird. bad it's good movies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've heard of that one. Polly Shore movies. There's one that came out a couple years ago with Natalie Portman that's similar where there's everything inside this bubble is mutating. I can't remember what it's called. Oh, it's weird. It's gross. <laughs> that is a crazy um, movie. I know my, what you're talking about. My wife and I watched it, and we were like, I feel like I need to just sit in the bathtub for a it week. It is like, a weird movie. It yeah, was where weird. they're in the shimmer. The shimmer, yeah. No, but, but the, the movie... Name, uh, I don't remember the name of the movie. Bro. It's a weird movie. It's I do not recommend watching it. It's freaking insane. Now, see, I like that movie. A lot. Really? I like it a lot. Oh, man. It drove me nuts. Because it's so creepy. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was like, I feel very, very gross. <laughs> yeah. Well. But uh, the land of Nod, the word Nod means wandering. Mm. So it, it follows up with his curse that he would be a fugitive and a wanderer. So Even he went into phrase, a land East of wandering. Of Eden. Somebody wrote a book called East of Eden. I can't remember yeah. who it was. But yeah, that idea that we're getting further and further away from Eden. Yeah. Um. And uh, it's also kind of a, there's a parallel. Well, the next verse, Cain knew his wife. So then again, who was his Where wife? Where did his wife come from? Yeah. <laughs> We've already given clues to that in this episode. So it's either co-atomism or it's a distant, or yeah. it's a relative of Do some kind. Do your research. Um, <laughs> maybe it was an Elohim. No, I'm just kidding. That comes a little later. <laughs> there's no, yeah. There's also no implication in the Hebrew Bible that any of them were female. That's that true. like Elohim yeah. or female. No angels, no divine beings are ever called female. Yeah. There's actually a so goddess. So where did all these goddesses come from? Yeah, there's actually a goddess named in the Old Testament, and it uses the masculine hmm. form of the noun. Hmm. Uh, is it? It's not Ishtar. It's uh, it's Isis? one of her. No, I no. can't remember. <laughs> That's Egyptian. Yeah, we'll post it on Instagram. Yeah, we'll figure fun, it out. Fun stuff. But he had a son named Enoch, not the same Enoch. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it says, when he built a city, he called the, man, the name of the city after his son Enoch. So here we see he's a fugitive and a wanderer. And remember, he's got this fear of being killed. Mm-hmm. So what does he do? He builds a city. Yeah. He builds walls. He's right? going to fortify himself. Yeah. But this begins kind of a ripple effect, mm-hmm. um, kind of, or a domino effect, if you will, because... Other ancient Near Eastern cultures, like Sumerians, believed in this city, uh, that the first city was, what, Eridu or something? Uh They actually, historians actually connect it to this city of Enoch in the Bible. Hmm. And this was the establishment of kings, like uh, monarchies, Mm -hmm. okay? 
And the reason certain people were chosen to be kings and lead civilization was because they communicated with the gods. Mm. And they called them in like Sumerian culture, the Apkalu. Yep. And there were, there were sages, like you can look up the seven sages and stuff. And there was the but they taught, the Apkalu, yeah. They taught how, men how to build civilization. Yeah. And they taught about, well, uh, we'll read it in verse. Uh, and it sounds a lot like another story that's biblically based. You're talking about Genesis 6? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, well, that's... Or, or the book of Enoch goes into that. Right. The book but of that, Enoch goes into it again, specifically almost like it, how it does here in, in verses like this 19 is why through 22. We've been recording for about an hour now. Yeah. Or a little over an hour, I think. And um, this is why at the beginning of the of this episode, we said we we're going to talk about Genesis 6 and the Watchers and the Nephilim and Noah. But we have to back up and we'll talk about Cain first. Give the backstory. This yeah. is why we had to back up so far. Because this is where the first city is built. Yeah. And historically culturally in the Near East, in the ancient Near East, mm. there's this association with cities and civilization. They believed that it was given to them by divine beings. By the gods. Yeah. yeah. Um, by the Apkalu, yeah. who, you know, we and equate to right, Elohim or right. Watchers. Right. There's different names of these beings and civilizations yeah. through the through the centuries. But yeah, yeah it, the Apkalu was a big one. <clears throat> that was, uh, let's see, that was... I believe Sumerian. Let's see. Or yeah, Akkadian, Sumerian. Yeah, um, that was their their terms for it. You see that in cuneiform texts, which we can't get into. If you want to look up cuneiform, it's fun. Uh, then you have like the Anunnaki, which yeah. are from another That's, civilization. That gets into like Mesopotamian, Babylonian, right? I and think. The, but it's the same story. Same it's stuff. almost like the flood narrative. It's like every civilization through history has had this idea of, oh, there was this big flood and it wiped out everything. And we yep. had to start all over. The Sumerian now we king have list this that I mentioned earlier right. has kings listed all the way up to a flood and then kings listed after the right. flood. Right, and then you have Gilgamesh so and the flood. Now, yeah. So it's this narrative. Here we have the same thing. It's this idea that divine beings came down from heaven. They gave us the knowledge that we were seeking, how to build civilization, how to make weapons, how to do all this stuff. And we're going to get into the details of that biblically through the book of Enoch. Yeah. But, yeah, it kicks off in Well, Genesis not biblically. Sure. Just we're going to get well, through the, it biblically and the through the book of Enoch. The idea, yeah, because <laughs> you see here it's like, you know, with Cain, you know. It, I think I think unless you're Ethiopian, the book of Enoch is not <laughs> in your Bible. <laughs> right, right. The biblical uh, the biblical interpretation of what's going yeah, on in Genesis yeah. 6. Uh, but, yeah, even, you know, like verses 19 through 22, you know, it's talking about all these people that, you know, well, this one did this and this one did that. And. This yeah. is how civilization was built. And where did all this knowledge come from? Yep. Um, and I want to I wanna point this out real quick, too. Uh, it says in verse 19, Genesis 4, 19, mm-hmm. Lamech, uh, Lamech, Lamech, I don't know how to Lamech, pronounce it. Lamech, yeah, I don't know. I say Lamech, and you said that was wrong last time. So It just sounded weird. Lamech. <laughs> uh, he is the seventh in line, if you go, Adam is number one, Cain is number two, and mm. then Cain's descendants, Lam- Lamech is the seventh. Mm. And again, the, the idea of seven representing completion. Mm-hmm. So, um, the first thing that I saw here was that he took two wives for himself. Yeah, <laughs> he was like, so you know what? Me. You know what? I'm taking two wives. Yeah, <laughs> this is like it's funny. Like verse 17, it's like. Cain had relations with his wife. And then Lamech is like, I'm taking two wives. Yeah, and also Adam and Eve. Like, don't you think if God's, he wants humans to multiply, why didn't he make more than one wife for Adam? Yeah, it's interesting. So, again, it's the idea of order mm-hmm. versus chaos. Yep. Tell me you have more order if you have more than one wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not convinced. Let's just say Lamech didn't get any time in the bathroom yeah, with right. two wives. But this is a representation of, of chaos, right? Uh, right, right? So he, I'm not trying to criticize wives. That sounds super like sexist. No, multiple wives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he took two wives. So polygamy, this is the first instance of polygamy in Ooh. the Bible, or the first time it's mentioned. And it says that... Uh, it's kind of funny of them, that it says for himself. For like, himself. I'm making this decision. Nobody's yeah. going to tell me what to exactly. do. I'm doing exactly. what I want. Yeah. Uh, so his, his one wife, Ada, bore... Jabal or Jabal. Mm-hmm. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Mm-hmm. So uh, then verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. 
He was the first of those who, to play the lyre and the pipe. So and got then, the first rock rock musician right here. Yeah. Playing and the then guitar. his other wife, Zilla, Zilla bore Tubal Cain, who was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. So that's where you start to get this idea of um, a, like civilization, like livestock and, and tents and, and stuff. And it seems like the ball is rolling pretty quickly yeah. here, that they're forming all this stuff. Yeah. Where, where are they getting this, this technology and this wisdom yeah. to create all this? Yeah, well, if you only look at what you have right here to work with, you think, oh, they just came well, up with it on their own. They just came up with stuff. But if you look at what we have found, what archaeologists and historians and you know anthropologists, what people have found is that these ancient religions believe that all these things were taught to us by gods. Right. By, by you know, by the beings. Heavens, beings in the heavens. Yeah. So, so there's a little more going on here than what's mentioned. And again, I think that that context is left out because the ancient Israelite reading this would not have needed that explanation. They already knew. They all would that. have known the story. Right. They knew all that yeah. stuff already. But uh, we're going to see kind of repeats of this in the Book of Enoch. That the watchers that came down, the angels that came down, and taught men how to certain things. Right. You know. And we even have modern context for that story today. Although I deny almost everything that they come up with, what the, that they uh, their conclusions come to ancient aliens. Yeah. You know, it's this whole idea that yeah. oh, the gods have come down, the aliens have come down, oh, and they yeah, taught us, yeah, and they yeah. built the pyramids, and they you know, it's alien like alien technology. They even have part of the story right, but you know, of course, most of their conclusions are bunk. Um, but yeah, it's that idea. It's still in our consciousness, you know, yep. that people are still thinking about this. Like someone gave us, we have these been ideas. given this stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so, so the the Bible is uh, it's a lot more fun than you you give it credit for sometimes. Um, let's talk about we because we're going we're going kind of long here. Let's talk about Enoch real quick, mm, um, yeah. because we had a question from a listener mm-hmm. that was, why was Enoch taken? We have listeners? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually do have a question about, yeah, go ahead. We got a question about the book of Enoch, which we're going to talk about in, in not today. More in but depth later. later. Yeah. But we got a question about Enoch himself. Why was he taken? Was he special? Mm. And so um, I want to, I was just mentioning that Lamech, Lamech, mm-hmm. I'm going to say it different every yeah. time that he's the seventh in line from Adam by Cain. Yeah. And again, that number seven is important. There's another seven. And so Lamech took two wives, so that's polygamy, and he has this, this boast, this, this song that he's, that he sings in verse 23 and 24. Uh, Ada and Zillah hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. Mm-hmm. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's revenge is 77-fold. Mm. And I used to think that he was confessing here, but if you study it, uh, scholars will tell you that he's bragging. This, mm. is, this is actually a boast. This is a poem. Yeah. He's, he's singing this about himself. Yeah. And so, he again, so he's a polygamist and a murderer. Yeah, and we kind of see that. Well, I kind of hinted at that in verse 19. Yeah. He's going to take for himself. He's taking I'm doing for what I want. And then he's like, look at me. I've killed <clears throat> somebody and I'm proud about it. Yeah. I've done like my, like my buddy Cain. So being, <laughs> being the seventh in line and seven representing completion, mm-hmm. he represents the destiny of the wicked. That, mm. that wickedness leads to more wickedness. Chaos leads to more chaos and ultimately to destruction. And we're going to see that in Genesis 6. But if you look at Seth, so Cain, Cain was forced, or he was uh, cursed, and he was told he was going to be a wanderer and a fugitive. Uh, Eve, who, so let's get this in perspective too. Eve was told that her seed would kill the serpent, Crush would destroy the serpent, the serpent right? Yep. So Adam and Eve have this hope for redemption, for right. the restoration of paradise. Right. Okay, how, how terrible did they feel when Abel was killed? Yeah, like oh my so gosh. They, they, she probably thought when Cain was born, oh Cain is our hero. He's gonna Cain's going to be the guy. Yeah. And then she had Abel, and she's like, great, I've got two sons now. Right. Well, Cain kills Abel. She was probably heartbroken. Oh my Not gosh. only because she's got one kid killing the other kid, but because now, who's going to save us? Right. That prophecy is. Yeah. Where's it going? So then she has Seth, and mm-hmm. she says, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. Mm. And the wor- the name Seth is basically, she says, God has appointed. Mm-hmm. It's it's set, like, um, to put in place. Yeah. And so where Cain was a wanderer, Seth was appointed. Mm-hmm. So she believes now that Seth is the one that's going to save him. 
And the end of chapter four is really interesting because it says, Seth had a son who was born and his name was Enosh. Now mm-hmm. Enosh, uh, which in Hebrew, it's, uh, or the, the word, the transliteration is E-N-O-S, en- Enosh. Mm-hmm. And it is another name for man. So remember, Adam means man. Right. Enosh also means man, but in Hebrew, they have different connotations. Enosh represents the fallen man. Hmm. Okay. And so Adam has connotations of like hope, basically. He can be redeemed. He can be divine. Mm -hmm. Enosh does not. Hmm. And it says in verse 26, Seth, uh, Seth had a son and named him Enosh. And it says, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Mm. And so we see that as corruption and wickedness is spreading, uh, his name is honestly, I believe, symbolic here because it represents that men are acknowledging their fallen state and that mm-hmm. the Lord is their hope for redemption. Yeah. And you probably, again, in the context that we've just given, you have the descendants of Cain going out and causing chaos and probably worshiping other gods yeah. at this point, idolatry and all this stuff. Um, and so the descendants of Enosh are saying, we're not going to worship their gods. We're not going to be a part of the chaos. We need to call upon Yahweh. Mm-hmm. And so it's an interesting, like, um, you know, contradiction here. Right. Uh, and, and we're going to, we're going to get a behind the scenes look at all that when we get to Genesis yeah, 6. It, and it what talks is, about people calling out. Right. And, and stuff. what is happening yeah, now. Genesis 6 and Enoch, the book of Enoch talks about the people who cried out to the Lord to right. save them and all that. So, um, so anyway, that's the, that's the context here that Eve, Eve was looking for the Savior, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, what, that's kind of what Enosh represents. And an illustration of that is in Psalms 8, or Psalms 5. I told you about this recently, mm-hmm. uh, but Psalms 5 has a, what people believe to be a messianic prophecy. Um, it says... Uh, when I look at the works, so this is verse three, uh, I'll start in verse three. It says, when I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the, the moon and stars that you set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? So son of man is a term that's used for the Messiah, right? Yeah. The son of man is a theme that's all over in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. But the... Use a lot of Daniel too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, and that was Enoch, one of Jesus's favorite terms about himself. Yeah. He called um, himself son of man a lot. I think Ezekiel also is, what's the Valley of Dry Bones story? Be. Is that Ezekiel? It's in the Old Testament. All the <laughs> listeners are judging me for not remembering this now. But he's called the son of man. Mm. And, um, and then um, Enoch, in the book of Enoch, it calls him the son of man, yeah, I believe. True. Yeah. And so uh, anyway, so it's, maybe so it's, it's, this, this it's like a prophet. Messianic it's, figure. It is. It is. It's a type. It's what's considered right, a type. Right. Um, it's a foreshadowing of something that's going to happen. Right. And so, but the word there, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? The first word man is Enosh. What is man that you're mindful of him? Mm. That's the fallen man. Yeah. And then it says the son of man that you care for him. That's Adam, mm. the son of man. And so that's how we know that those two words are one is one represents, you know, you're mindful of fallen men. Yeah. Um, and you care for the, the son of man. Yeah. But verse five, you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. Mm-hmm. This is Psalms chapter five, verse five. You've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands and put all things under his feet. Sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, mm-hmm. birds of the heavens, fish of the sea, whatever passes, uh, along the paths of the sea. That, that's chaos, right? Mm-hmm. So that's where we get the messianic profile from about the son of man. David is singing this about maybe himself or somebody else, but it's also the hope of a savior in the future. Right. The same thing Eve was looking for. Right. So this, you've made man a little lower than heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor is, that's a huge, that's a huge statement for yeah. somebody to make pre-Christ, right. you know? Um, and that might play into why some of Genesis 6 might have happened. Yeah. That these divine beings are looking at man and going, wait a minute. Yeah. He's, he's supposed to be lower than us. They're lower than us, yeah. But what's happening well, also, here? Also, Adam, like, think about Adam in the garden. He was literally a little lower than the angels. Right. Like man was made a little yeah, lower than the angels. Was, yeah. I think that's why the word Adam there is, it says the son of Adam. Yeah. B'nai uh, Adam. Yeah. So I think that's important because Adam was made a little lower than the angels. That's how God views humans. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is, you can't apply this to Christ, mm-hmm. that he took a human form. Right. And God gave him glory and honor and dominion over everything. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really interesting. And that's how messianic prophecy works. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all, um, 
I've heard Michael Heiser talk about this act and reenactments and yeah. foreshadowing. Right. Something plays out one time and Jesus does it again, you know? Yeah, d- dude. <clears throat> Heiser's got a video on YouTube. Go watch it now. Just turn our podcast off and go watch this video. He's talking about demons, but he's talking about also the messianic profile. Like, that how did. Uh, how did people know that Jesus was the Messiah yeah. when he started casting out demons? Yeah. Cause it's not anywhere in the old Testament that that's part of his like job description as a, as a Messiah, yep. but they recognize something about him having rule over demons as it is very interesting stuff. Yeah. I just, I love this. I could geek out over Psalms five all day, Yeah, but that's, it just, it, the word, the, the, I can't think of the word, the contrast between the word Enosh in verse four and, yeah. and Adam, the son of Adam. And then it says, made him a little lower than heavenly beings, glory and honor. You've given him dominion. Remember Adam had dominion over everything. Mm-hmm. And so it's that idea of restoration. It's that idea of going back to how humanity used yeah. to be, you know? Um, and it's the story of everything really, you know, the light and the dark, this battle that's going on since this time, you yeah. know? Every story we read, every movie we watch, you know, has some aspect of this good versus evil, you know, type thing going on. Yeah. And I think that's why we resonate with so many things in culture, why we love Star Wars. You know, there's the, there's the Jedi and there's the the Sith, you know, and that's like just these classic stories that have been with us forever. Yeah. Um, On that theme of redemption, the redemption of man, and then this is coming full circle. I'm going to finish what I was saying about, about the seventh generation. Um, if you read Genesis chapter five, are you about to have an altar call? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want people to to call in if you uh, <laughs> call in, <laughs> message us on Instagram if you want just to just kneel these wherever ways. you are. Hey, if you're driving, though, pull over. Seriously though, maybe somebody who's not listening, hey, who's not yeah, saved, man. is listening. Yeah. And and I hope that this gives you hope. Like, yeah, why definitely. do Christians hold to this so definitely. so strongly? It's because we see how God made humanity exactly, and what we we're intended for, and how sin separates us from that. Yeah. And the whole story of humanity, the whole Bible, is a story of how God is trying to bring us back to right. him back to eden right. back to our you can pre-fallen you can, state you can right? get back into eden in in some sense i've been studying I, i'll hesitate to even bring this up <laughs> because it hesitate because of a it's a huge rabbit trail but yeah. i've been studying about like the idea of like theosis and sanctification and mm. all that stuff and becoming like god the sons of god and all mm-hmm. that fascinating but yeah the whole story of the bible is just god's plan for humanity to be secured right. to be brought right. back not just humanity but all creation. all of creation yeah right yeah, yeah because he's bringing everything back yep. to eden yeah and, um, and and i think i think when people are honest with themselves they, they know they're far from god they know they're close with god it's like you know what's in your heart um and i would say the person that's far from god like you can look at this world you can feel the tension like, you know, it's there. It's in your heart. You yeah. were made for eternity. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I want to say Solomon's wrote that God put eternity in the hearts of man. Like, so they had, they know it deep down in their heart. They can say with their mouth all they want. Oh, there's no God. I don't believe in all that. You know. Yeah. And uh, most people can honestly say, man, the world just doesn't feel like it's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, well, it's identifying those, the, the three dichotomies that we bring up, I, I think we brought them up the last few episodes, chaos and order, yeah, darkness versus light, right, life and death. And I mean, yeah, like you said, our, our, our consciences, our right. own spirits acknowledge. We desire order. Yeah, we desire order. We <laughs> desire life. Why? We Why desire do we light. desire order? Yeah, because yeah. it's put in us. Yeah. And so God is trying to restore that. Right. And that's, that's part of his, kind of like we were saying with Cain, like maybe there was this arm around him, you know, like, yeah. Hey, like, here's the truth. Don't you here's, know if you do good? Right. Yeah. And it's the same now. It's like, God can put his, uh, it's, as cheesy as it sounds, yeah. it's real. Yeah. Like yeah. God can, in a sense, put his arm around you and say, Hey, look, look at the world. Like it's chaos, yeah. but I'm calling you to order. Yeah. Come on somebody. Hello. Come on now. Just call that 1-800 number. So we will send you a prayer here, cloth. <laughs> here is a literary <laughs> illustration of that. So Genesis chapter five starts with the generations of Adam. Mm. It says when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. We're so close to Genesis six. I know, man. (laughs) Uh, Male and female, he created them. Okay. So this is interesting. Uh, It says when the generations of Adam, 
So that's a proper noun, Adam. Remember we talked about the man versus right, the name yeah, Adam? The man. So the generations of Adam, proper noun. But then it says when God created man, he, so this is humankind. This is the man. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he made men, oh, you can say that, he made them in the likeness of God, male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man, Adam, mm-hmm. when they were created. Mankind, yeah. Yeah. And now it's talking about the, the, hum, the person, Adam, again. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, mm-hmm. just like he was made in God's likeness. Right. He has a son in his likeness, and he named him after his image, and he named him Seth. So again, we see how Cain is a deviation. Mm. Cain's wickedness separated him from that. He's not, yeah. he's not even considered the line of Adam anymore mm. because he's not Adam's image, because he's not Yahweh's image, right? Yeah. So he says, uh, Adam had a son in his likeness, named Seth. Uh, the days of Adam, uh, after he fathered Seth, was 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. There right. you go. That's what's the thing I was looking for, yeah. Thus, all the days that Adam's lived, Adam lived for 930 years, and he died. 930 years. Yeah. Which Earth. could be literal, could be symbolic, could be both. Maybe, yeah. Could be both. So Numbers are tricky. Um, I really do want to do an episode about math and gematria and Dude, numerology. I, I have a couple of people that are friends that are that teach mathematics yeah. in, in colleges and stuff and they're like you'd be surprised how many mathematicians are christians yeah from doing math yeah like looking at math and studying math and the geometry of math and all that stuff and like there's a designer out there yeah like, there's no well, again, way. order right something exactly. has to create order they order look at doesn't the, happen naturally right they look at yeah. the order of math and they're like my god like there's a quote I need to find it maybe so we can post it, but I was listening to um, Stephen Myers, I believe is his name. Yeah, yeah. So he's a Christian like physicist or yeah. something. Brilliant. And he was saying that there is a, I believe an atheist a physicist that has a book that, where they're talking about Big Bang and stuff, mm-hmm. and he basically says the whole universe can be expressed in mathematics. Yeah. And he says that you can, you can use math to trace the universe all the way back to a single point, back to the origin of the universe. Mm-hmm. But he says something in the book, and I'll, maybe we can post the link to this video. I'll go find it. But Stephen Meyer is quoting this guy's book, and he says in, the, in this book, the guy says um, that the, or, the, the, the origin of the entire universe is math. But math is a uh, concept that only exists in the mind. Mm-hmm. So whose mind did it exist in right. at the beginning of time? Exactly. And I think that what he says in the video is because that guy's not a Christian, he just moves on. He doesn't yeah. even try to answer He's that like, question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's a crazy, he, that is a crazy thought. Right, sure, yeah. I mean, dude, that blew my mind when I heard that. Right. If, if math only exists in the mind and it, you can explain everything mathematically. Right. Whose mind did the universe exist in? Exactly. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. And for for that's, someone who's not a Christian to say that. That's where know? that part, you know, that those that don't believe in God, they've they've become fools. Not yeah. that they're stupid people, but yeah. it's like it's obvious. Like it's obvious. You look at nature and it's obvious. Yeah, man. But they don't want to acknowledge the obvious. Crazy. Okay, I st- still haven't made my point. No. This is the same thing. Same thing happens every time. I have this beautiful. We already, beautiful we already outline. gave the one eight hundred number to call in. Oh, no. I have this beautiful outline, and then and then I can't even get through it all. That's fine. But uh, so you have Seth. Seth gave birth to uh, Enosh. We talked about the name. Seth Enosh. gave birth. Seth gave birth. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Seth fathered. Uh huh. He Enosh. fathered Enosh. Uh, Enosh fathered Kenan. I'm skipping all the numbers because that's mm-hmm. not important right now. Right. Kenan fathered Mahalalel. Mahalalel fathered uh, Jared, mm. and Jared fathered Enoch. So now we're at Enoch, and it says that um, Enoch fathered Methuselah, and it says in verse 22, just chapter 5, 22, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. It says Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And so, that's where we should end the episode. Yeah. Stay tuned. Stay next tuned week. for where did Enoch go? Yeah, but I will I will point this out that Enoch is seventh in line from, from Adam uh, by, by Seth. On the other side. Yeah. Yep. And so where the seventh in line by Cain is Lamech, and he's a polygamist who murders people, and right. he represents— And boasts in it. Yeah, and he's yeah bragging. Right. So he represents wickedness and, and destruction and chaos. Enoch is the seventh from Adam. So again, the number seven is completion. Mm -hmm. And what happens to him? He gets taken by God because he was a holy man. Right. 
and um, taken by God to where? To where? Yeah. Stay tuned yeah. in the next so episode. So we'll, we'll talk about Enoch in the next episode, <laughs> I suppose. But I do think that that's a cool. A lot of people think that um, it's a cool that contrast. It, it's written that way on purpose. Right. That right. Lamech represented what happens to the wicked, and right. Enoch represents what happens to the righteous. Yeah, and it's another. It's another thing of like what God was telling Cain. If yeah. you do right, you know, it'll yeah. be okay. If you don't, sin is waiting, waiting to get yeah. you. And it's because, uh, so it says, I, I wrote this quote down. I don't remember where I got it. I'll have to find it. It says, seven was symbolic in the ancient Near Eastern Israelite culture. It communicated a sense of fullness or completeness. And it has the symbols here. It's three characters. Mm-hmm. I don't know Hebrew, so I'm not going to say what they are. Right. But it says the number seven is spelled with the same consonants as the word complete or full. Mm. So again, in Hebrew, the letters and numbers use the same characters. So a mm. lot of times when they give a number, they are actually, it's like a code. They're right. given some idea. Yeah. I think that's um, called gramatria. Yeah. 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 Which is really fascinating. So that'll be for a future topic too. Yeah. But anyway. So next episode. What happened to Enoch? We're going to get into Enoch, maybe the book of Enoch. Yeah. And really get into the nitty gritty of why I joined this podcast. <laughs> and that <laughs> the is whole to talk reason about here. the Nephilim, the Watchers, <clears throat> what transaction happened, yep. and how it has affected everything to this day. Yeah, guys, this this episode is a long one. Our previous episode was long. This one's long, too. Yeah. And uh, it's just hard to get all this stuff in. Yeah, I mean... It's- so this is gonna this is gonna take several episodes to explain. Yeah. But we we're we're in for it. It's gonna be awesome. We hope you guys like Hallelujah. it. If you want more information or you have questions, you can message us on Instagram at behind the curtain PC or email us on our Gmail address. It's behind the curtain PC at gmail dot com. Um, maybe you were inspired by our 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 little gospel message earlier, and you yeah. want to know more about yeah. how to know Christ or how to study the Bible or something let us know so that we can help you also um you know we'll we'll post follow-ups of some of this information on instagram and we are working on like a blog and stuff so um we'll probably post our notes if some of this stuff has touched you or if you've learned something or if you've been convicted or if you're like mad at something we said yeah like let us know like we want to hear like Man, like we really encouraged so and so, or you know, we really made so and so mad, and how we, can we fix that? <laughs> we do want to. Our goal is to talk about the three falls. So we're on the second one now, Genesis yeah. six, okay. the, and and the flood, yeah. and then in the future we'll talk about Genesis ten and eleven, the table of nations and the Tower of Babel. Got some towers that are being built, some um, pyramids. But structures. outside of those topics, we really want this to be listener driven. Yeah. And so um, we want to help try to answer some of y'all's questions because Josh and I are not afraid to look up weird stuff. Yeah, you definitely. Know? Well. The listeners, aka me, wants to talk about magic and sorcery and drugs yeah. and how all of that stuff goes together. Yeah, with like spiritual stuff. Dude, yeah, it's crazy. And then, and then we got a question about like some doctrinal stuff too, like salvation. Oh and yeah, like Jesus being, and stuff. Being yeah, sinless and. Oh yeah, that's we, a big, big thing. So, so we're gonna tackle some of the crazy things, and we're gonna tackle yeah. some of the doctrinal very things, doctrinal but, practical but yeah these are all based on questions people have asked us so that's where oh, we're getting yeah. this content so yep. chime in y'all email us message us on instagram yeah instagram's the, the quickest easiest way and if you know someone that might be interested in hearing this please, please share, share it, it. Yeah. share it with your grandma my grandma listens that is dope she does man she loves it that's really cool so well anyway that's it hallelujah see you later <laughs> we'll see you next week <laughs>